excited to have here uh, today Kevin Blackestone, uh, the man who wears many, many hats. You might know him from <laughs> ESPN, uh, Washington Post, NPR. He's also a professor at the University of Maryland. Uh, but today, Kevin, uh, we really wanted to talk about one more hat that you wear, and that is a producer uh, for the documentary film, Imagining the Indian. Uh, so first of all, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having the, uh, the uh, desire to invite me. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, what we really want to talk about here is Native American mascots and some movement sure. that we've had on it recently. And I guess my first question is, uh, you occupy a unique space, not just because of your stance with the Washington mascot, but also you're a Washington fan. So how did you negotiate that for all these years saying, I'm very anti this mascot, but I'm not abandoning my team? Well, part of our film talks about the evolutionary process that people like me um, have gone through over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and so you're exactly right. I mean, I grew up here. Um, I grew up a diehard fan of this team. Uh, my family was one of the fortunate ones to have season tickets. Um, so uh, I, you know, I would say that I bled burgundy and gold. Um, and I never thought once about the name until the 1992 Super Bowl, Washington versus Buffalo in Minneapolis. And I had just started working uh, in the sports department. And I asked the sports editor if I could go just as a fan. I said, I just want to, this is my, who knows when this will come along again. I just want to do it. So he said, sure. And, um, and as I was going into the stadium, uh, I noticed a commotion, um, on one of the streets and I went to check it out and it was a protest against the name of the team. And I stood there for a while and took it all in. And I'm, of course, dressed in burgundy and gold and the logo and the name. And I uh, didn't really think that much of it again until uh, the mid-late 90s when I uh, was writing a column about the Midland Lee High School team in Midland, Texas. And the reason I was writing about it was because it was drenched in Confederate imagery, as Robert E. Lee might suggest. And it had a number of um, black stars on its football and basketball teams. Um, and the NAACP had engaged the school district in trying to get the name changed. They were protesting over that. And I gravitated towards that issue, obviously. And I started to think back to the nickname of this team that I grew up rooting for and the protests that I had encountered. And, and by that time, there had been um, a lawsuit filed against the trademark. Uh, and that's really when I started to get queasy about writing the name, saying the name, and cheering the name. Um, and it just became more and more clear to me over time that I could no longer embrace this name. Uh, and so that's really, that's really how, how I came to approach the issue. So what, where, what is your stance on this as far as it seems like Washington is, or was, I guess right. we should say, the, the lowest hanging fruit, but there are other Native American names. Uh, is it the name that's the problem? Is it the image? Is it the ritual? Do we need to get rid of all of them? Um, yes, we need to get rid of, <laughs> get rid of all of them. Um, and I would say it's not the low hanging fruit but it's the top of the iceberg. And, and I say that because, as you know, from the great work that you've done on this, Mascot Nation, um, slowly over time, there has been an erosion of these nicknames and images uh, in sports, particularly at the high school level um, and certainly at the college level. I mean, we know of any number of colleges uh, who over the years, since the 1970s, have change their name, change their mascot, change their imagery. So, but at the top of this, this, uh, this iceberg is this name. And the reason, one of the reasons I'm focused on it is not only because of this name, but once again, because I grew up here as a fan of this team. Um, and this is the biggest sport 
um, uh, in this country, um, you know, a $15, $20 billion industry. Uh, this team is a multi-billion dollar um, uh, franchise. And so, and, and there's no more egregious name, I don't think, than this if we want to if we want to compare and measure um, appropriateness, right? Um, so that's why the focus on this team. And as far as getting rid of the, getting rid of every other thing, you know, it's it's forgotten on a lot of people. And I think you remind people in your in your book about this. But this team has over the years gotten rid of a lot of this imagery. Um, it it still has the logo. Um, but it no longer has cheerleaders who dress up like, um, like uh, adolescent um, native girls. Uh, it no longer has uh, a big drum that it used to put in the, it's, it, in the middle of the field um, and have some pretend Indian uh, run around on the drum. Um, it no longer is drenched in Confederate imagery um, which it was uh, in the 50s and early 60s when George Preston Marshall, the original owner and founder um, of the team, uh, knew that the Southern market was his market and he marketed it to, uh, to white Southerners. And one of the things that he did, of course, was he kept the team all white until he was forced at the point of bayonet by the federal government to integrate. And that happened to include um, a marching band um, which used to play Dixie before every home game um, and a fight song that used to include the um, refrain fight for old Dixie which then got changed to fight for old DC so um, uh, and my father uh, just so happened and I learned this later in the 90s uh, was the person who protested against the team uh, band, the marching band playing Dixie back in the 60s. He wrote a letter to Edward Bennett Williams, who was the acting president at the time because George Preston Marshall um, uh, was uh, uh, incapacitated with, uh, by age. And uh, he, he, he brought this up to Edward Bennett Williams and Edward Bennett Williams wrote him back and basically said, thank you for pointing this out and, and uh, we'll see to it that uh, Negro patrons are not um, uh, uh, meant to feel uncomfortable um, coming to our games with this song playing. So um, it has done these things over the years. So it can take, it could always have taken um, one more step. But yes, you know, talking to Native folk, and I'm sure you've, you've done the same, um, they're bothered, bothered by all of this. Um, uh, you know, even, even the, the, the fight around here with fans to who want to keep red something in the name uh, is problematic because that's still, that's so close to what was here and it reminds them of blood, which was the, the red skin, the scalp. So um, they really just need to make a, make a, a clean break. Well, it, it's interesting you bring up a lot of examples and said really starting in the 1970s, we started to eliminate these things because, you know, I, I feel like that's when the debate changed. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, the last or the most recent selection of a Native American name of any professional sports team in America was the Chiefs, and that was in the 60s. Yep. Every bit of that discussion afterward was not, should we name our new team this? It was what teams get grandfathered in and in what ways do they? Right. So, are there any exceptions to this rule? Like, you know, Florida State is cited for their relationship with the Seminole Nation of Florida. Are there exceptions or things that should be grandfathered in? I don't think there's anything um, that I've ever talked to Native folk about that should be grandfathered in. I, I think all of these images need to be done away with, including um, uh, the Seminoles at, at Florida State. Uh, and I know that that vexes some people because they well, well, why is it that Florida State has an exception and, and uh, the Seminole Nation doesn't seem to have a problem with it? Um, and what they don't realize is, is that the Seminole Nation is pretty large. And there are Seminoles in Florida, there's Seminoles es elsewhere, and there are plenty of Seminoles in Florida and elsewhere who are uncomfortable with the continued use of the name 
um, and the imagery, uh, no matter the, um, uh, the contractual deal that the Seminoles in Florida have cut with Florida State in terms of education uh, and all of that, it still reduces a people to something less, to mascots. Uh, it reduces a, it turns a people into um, an, a, uh, uh, an animal playing the gators. Um, and, and so that's what's really problematic about all this. And, and the other thing I've come to learn over time, and, and I'm working with Ben West on this film, who was from DC, he's uh, Cheyenne, his father, is um, Richard West, who is one of the founding directors of the uh, National Museum for the American Indian here in DC, uh, is about the clothing and the feathers and what these all mean to native people and how they are uh, a great deal sacred. Um, and so this is sacrilege that we see um, on Saturday afternoons in a lot of cases. Uh, so, yeah, we have to get rid of those. Nobody should have um, uh, an exception. Um, that's really just a cop out. Uh, you know, the, the dictionary is this big. We got a bunch of nouns in there. Find another one. <laughs> sure. And that, that was what was interesting to me, I know, was the minute we got rid of this nickname in Washington, then the question was, what do you want to name it? And I know we both discussed and said, I'd never really given it much thought. We aren't in the branding PR no. uh, element. But um, it was interesting because initially I heard, you know, the movement for Red Tails. I thought, right. okay, uh, maybe I can get behind this. And then I started to play that out more. And I'm like, okay, you're, you're moving from Native Americans to African Americans, you know, to honor the Tuskegee Airmen. And I picture right. people dressing up as... Uh, Tuskegee Airmen, and right. it just it seems like you really do need a clean break. You you do, and if you know what, if you want to honor the Red Tails, you want to honor the Tuskegee Airmen, give them a statue on the mall. We got plenty of room, <laughs> or 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 give them a statue in um in Tuskegee if there's not one already there. Um, and you know my other uh, uncomfortableness with that name is that it furthers militarizes game day in the NFL. I mean, we have the military uh, image in the, in the Star Spangled Banner. We have the presentation of the colors. We get the occasional flyover of military hardware. Um, we have appreciation for, to the troops. We, 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 we've got enough. Yeah. We, we, don't need, we don't need one more, um, uh, one more conflation of, of, of war and sport. I know we only have a couple minutes left here, but I wanted to get into, you know, the pushback on the other side, there's a couple ways this goes, but one is, hey, I didn't intend it this way. I don't right. see it as a slur. I've heard it this way my whole life. And for me, I always thought it was interesting. I harken back to, uh, you know, Lenny Bruce tried using mm. the N word over and over. And his right. argument was, if I say it long enough, it loses its power. Right. And so, is that what happened with the R word? Is that, you know, if, if enough people repeated it in mainstream media, did we stop seeing the slur portion of it? Hmm. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, and I love Lenny Bruce. Um, the, my only problem with, the Lenny, with Lenny Bruce and that argument for the, the right. R word is that, um, you could use it over and over with yourself, but could you use that with me if we're taking the Metro down to Southeast DC, which is still the, the uh, least diverse part of this city, the city that most reminds you of what it used to be when I was growing up, which is Chocolate City. And so I would argue um, probably not. I understand that if you use something over and over, you may define it. Um, but I don't think you're going to, you may define it among yourselves, but you're not going to define it with the people um, for whom it is a slur. Um, now, interestingly enough, uh, of course, one of the things that kind of stopped the momentum in the, uh, in the last few years in terms of forcing this team to change its name 
was the uh, Supreme Court case involving the Asian rock group out of the Pacific Northwest called the Slants. And uh, they wanted to trademark their name. Um, the federal government originally said you can't because that's considered disparaging towards Asian Americans or Asians. Mm -hmm. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically said uh, the First Amendment protects your right to use this name, even if it is disparaging, um, which made people here in Washington who are fans of the, the team and the name and Dan Snyder, the owner, jump up and applaud. But the slant's whole position was they were re reappropriating that name on their own as Asian people. Um, Damon Wayans tried to do the same thing um, a number of years ago when he uh, tried to put out a clothing line with the acronym that spelled out um, that spelled out phonetically the N word, and he got turned down by the trademark um, mm -hmm. uh, board um, because they said it was disparaging. So um, I guess it's in the it's in the it's really in the it's really in the beholder. Uh, if you're the target of it, it's going to be a problem. Um, if you want to use it because you think it'll go away, maybe within your group, but not with the group that, that is, is the target of the slur. Sure, sure. Uh, Kevin, I know we could talk about this for hours because we have before, but uh, um, I, I really want to thank you for uh, sharing your insights on this in this key moment. Thank like you. We're having here this summer, I know this is the summer where some of these things are coming down. Yeah, it is, it is amazing. We, we could not have had this, well, we could have had this conversation eight weeks ago uh, in, in late spring, um, but who knew that, the, that street protests against police lethality against armed black men would expand to the, to the fight, against, um, uh, fight against white supremacy, which would expand to knocking down monuments to Confederate, uh, uh, Confederate officers um, and Christopher Columbus, which brings us full circle back to these, <laughs> back to these nicknames. And we're it's amazing. All this, all this from our homes in the middle of the pandemic and <laughs> right. thinking it work. Just amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for volunteering your time. Always great to hear from you. Anytime. Thanks a lot.